spells are closing, getting past objections, and prospecting. That's what everybody wants to talk about. Sure. What nobody wants to talk about is what's most important, which is the middle part. Yeah. So in prospecting is the key to everything. It is the secret of life. In every sales conversation, the human being that has the, the, the greatest emotional control mm -hmm. has the highest probability of getting the outcome that they desire. It does make a difference if, you, if anybody signs up or not. That type of emotional control attracts people to you. It's like a magnet. How do you change the perception of the human being that you're having a conversation with? Likeable is to shut up and listen. Like you don't have to worry about anything else. If you're listening to people, they love you. So my guest today, fresh off our stage here in Louisville, Kentucky, at our event here called The Greatest. Here we have Jeb Blunt, author of Fanatical Prospecting, Sales EQ, and many, many others considered one of the top 25 most influential people in sales and marketing, and also has written considered the one of the most uh, well-read top 25 books in sales. So Jeff, thank you, thank you so much for being out yes, here. Yes, sir. Thank you. Outstanding, and uh, you know, you fought through the uh, the snow, you fought through the conditions, you got here. I'm fired up that you made the commitment to our event to be here. Your presence here is is, is uh, greatly appreciated. Well, it was totally worth it. <laughs> what an audience! They were amazing. That was uh, after you know after being uh, locked up doing virtual events for the last year to be able to walk on that stage with your group of people. Man, that was magic. That was fun. Everybody was like, "Goodness gracious, actually!" And, <laughs> and for the, a lot of them, they were uh, they were birthed and attracted to our company through mm -hmm. the pandemic too. So to, for them to get some actual professional sales training. Yep. Uh, was profound for them. So, um, you know, uh, Jim, a lot of our, a lot of our audience um, comes into our industry, and and like myself, I was in the military, had no sales background, had no 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 uh, business background. I mean, I was flying a helicopter off the side of a helicopter, a machine off the side of a helicopter, and many people were uh, servers. They were you know doing whatever. They're nurses, teachers, etc. And now they get involved in the insurance industry, mm -hmm. right? And so. What are some of the things that if, if they want to get good at this, they see the opportunity, mm -hmm. they see the opportunity insurance, if they want to get good at this, what are some of the fundamentals that people need to learn about sales? Well, I think that probably more than anything is understanding that sales is a system and a process. So it's what, kind of what we were teaching on the stage. Mm -hmm. I was just teaching a simple frame, right? So a simple framework. And if all a framework is, is a set of rails that you run on. So it's a system you run on that allows you to shift into context. So no matter what situation you're in, you know exactly what to do. In our case, it was ledge, disrupt, and ask. So if I know that three-step process, no matter what objection someone throws at me, I know what to do. So I think that's the biggest thing is, and if you didn't come from sales, you don't really think that way. You think sales is some sort of an art. You're like You see people selling and you're used to like sales being this gift of gab. And, but it really isn't really sales is more about listening. It's about connecting with people. And, and then the system, the system sets you up to do that. So I'm sure that you, you teach a system. So the system is you connect with people, you approach them, you have a conversation with them, you learn about them. The next step is this. So the one thing I always say to, to salespeople who are new is whatever organization you're working for probably has a system. And if they have the system, they have the system for a reason. So don't go try to make something else up. Follow the system. The system works. So once you have the system down, then you can begin filling in the skills. So you run the system, you learn what works and what doesn't work, and then you run the skills. And the skills are about uh, you know, getting good at like, asking the right question or understanding what words not to say. Like in this case, on stage we were talking about, you don't, tell, don't tell them you want to talk about you. you know, tell them you want to learn about them. Because they'll lean into that. People, people will have that conversation with you. Understanding that you've got to be likable and approachable and authentic. And, and I think that's probably the biggest thing. And then the advanced part of that is I've got a book called Sales EQ, which is the psychology of it. Like, so how do, how do people's brain work? I mean, every human being is predictable because our brains work in a particular way. So if, you, if you get that and understand it, then it gets, it gets again, it gets easy because I can predict what people are going to do based on what I do because that's what we do as human beings. And, and so I guess my, my, the, the, the long answer is master the system first, then work on the skills and then once you get the basic skills down, then keep studying, keep studying, and keep studying until you get good at it. And don't don't get yourself in a situation where you feel like I got to be the best person tomorrow. Because mm -hmm. the thing about sales, you're going to have bad days, yeah. and you're going to have days where you think you can't do this anymore. I know it. I've been there. I've done mm -hmm. it. I got the T-shirt, the tattoo. I've <laughs> run into the brick walls. 
but so much of sales is that. And then, you know, and then, uh, uh, you know, the, the big part of that is what you bring with you. So a lot of the people who are joining you are coming here because they have a dream. They have something they want to accomplish. They're, you know, they're tired of working for the man. They're, they want to, they, they want to build a business. They want to build a future. That desire, like that thing that's in your heart that drove you here, that's, that's the fuel that's going to keep you going as you start p- putting the pieces together and learning the craft. Gotcha. No, we were talking backstage and because I was very curious in how you got started in this type of work and you have obviously corporate sales uh, background, but what made you create your own company? And you said you came to a sales, uh, sales event and you came to a, uh, an, a big event where you said Tony Robbins, it was Tony Robbins. Uh, T- Tony Robbins, Tom Hopkins, uh, Brian Tracy. This was, I was, it was 1990. So I was 23, I think. I mean, I, I think I was 23, somewhere in that neighborhood. I was young. And I remember going to the event, it was huge. Like there was this massive room and um, I think, was it Lee Greenwood was there? He was seeing wow. it, you know, so I mean, just, you yeah, exactly. Wow. And we're, you know, we're all standing up and I saw Tony Robbins on stage and I'm like that, I mean, the, the, his ability to impact people, that really drove me. So I picked up Power Principles, not Power Principles, what was the name of his, uh, <laughs> that's not my, that's my book, but his, um, but it was Power, whatever. But I picked up his um, tape program and I, I listened to it so many times, I memorized it. Like I could say everything he said. And, and then I went, you know, I went, I studied the greats. Like I studied, um, Ziegler. I went to see, you know, Zig n- dozens of times. I saw Brian Tracy, Is he from Atlanta, Tom Hopkins. Uh, yeah. Zig was from, uh, from Dallas, Texas. He oh, was wow. from, from that area. Sorry, and, uh, and, you know, and, uh, and uh, of course, uh, you know, later in my life, I got to interview all these guys and have conversations with them. But, but I went into the, I mean, I went into re- the rest of my regular life. I mean, I went in, I got a job in the corporate world. I was in sales. I rose through the corporate ranks. I became a vice president of sales for a big company, but I never let the dream go. So I had something inside of me that wanted to do more than what I was doing and do something that I was meant to do. I mean, I think you, you know, I believe that there's a you know, higher sure. purpose for most people. So the great recession happened like for me like and i you know i'm of that generation so people that were in their mid 30s to mm-hmm. late 40s in 2006 2007 when the bottom fell out of the economy not different than it is right now and suddenly like i had a big corner office and big corporate job and all you all it takes is a moment like right. the company that i worked for for 17 years one day just decided we don't want you here anymore. And it was just like that. Like, it, I mean, there was no record. I didn't, there was nothing. And, you know, so, so at that moment I had to make a decision. Am I going to, am I going to follow a dream that I've always had or I'm going to go get back in the, on the hamster wheel. And I made a decision to follow the dream and it was a grind. I mean, I started off like I'm in my house, you know, sitting in a corner with, with a telephone, cold calling people. Wow. You know, and uh, I originally built an a online job board for salespeople, and I used to drive all over Florida, I live in Florida at the time, and I would go to job fairs, and I would crash job fairs. Like, I would walk in, and I had these flyers. I wouldn't crash your job fairs. Yeah, I would go, and I would go to all the little booths and say, listen, I run a job board. Why don't you post a job on my job board? And I would go and go and go until I could see the security guards. Like, someone would call the security guards. And I got tossed out of a few places. I would go faster, like, the security guards would come out, post a job, post a job. And I would get a handful here and there, and eventually I built the, you know, the number one sales job board on the planet. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then, you know, created cash flow and then built the re- you know, rest of the business on top of that. So, but for me, it was one of those pivotal moments where you, you have a choice to make. And there were, there were two paths I could have taken. I could have gone back to what I was doing before. I could have easily gotten a job back in the corporate world, but I just was, I was, I was disillusioned with how easy it was for someone just to end my dream. Boom. Just like that. So became an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur, started my own company, and um, and I feel like I got a company for law entrepreneurs. I feel like I got all the people around me are you know have an entrepreneurial spirit and spirit, and they're part of our organization, and we're able to to build and do something that's just just different. I mean, Sales Gravy has just got its own sort of ecosystem that works. Sure. Now you mentioned cold calls here in a second because a lot of our guys come into the insurance business uh, for the very first time, and you know uh, you know pros and cons, or what are your thoughts on it? Do you prefer brand new people to cold call and buy leads and cold call or go through the route of friends and family and look for referrals? If you had a choice, would you, what would you prefer? Well, I would I'd probably do both, you know, because what I want to do is amplify my impact. And so what I would start with are, I mean, referrals is going to be your best lead. So if you get, if someone gives you a referral, that's what you want. So you should be relentlessly asking for referrals. Yeah. And if you come into, especially in insurance, you want to begin with your circle of influence. So I want to begin with, with here and I want to call on all those people because 
if I if I call on those people and I get those people to start working with me, then I can then I can expand into their circle of influence and expand into their circle of influence. That's a lot easier because when people are familiar with you, familiarity breeds liking. It's a lot easier to have a conversation with them. But I'm a little bit different in that I also believe in making my own luck. So I believe that the more you prospect, the luckier you get. And and you know some people say, well, you know, gosh, I'll you know I make 500 calls and you know 10 people will talk to me. And I go, yeah, but you know I make 500 calls, 10 people talk to me, and one of those people that talk to me is now my largest customer, right? So I won. So I say you do a little bit of each. Plus, there's some real benefit in calling strangers. We were talking about this on stage, creating, building obstacle immunity, yeah. interrupting invisible strangers, like calling on strangers, meeting people anywhere you go. You're going to get a lot of rejection. You're going to get a lot of people telling you no, but you, 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 you kind of form a callus. Like you get really good at it. Yeah. And that makes you better when you start working in, in your circle. So I'm just a fan of doing both. That's not for everybody. Like there's some mm-hmm. people that, you know, the thought of like calling up a stranger or like approaching somebody they don't know is the most right. terrifying thing in the world for them. Yeah. You know, so like I always say, you know, the, the like public speaking yeah. terrifies people. It's like the worst thing. Right. Um, but, you know, but if you, if you said you can go on stage and talk for, you know, 15 minutes or you can make five cold calls, most people would pick the stage, right? right? Yeah. And um, so I think that the, I think that, that for me it's do both. But if you're smart, like start with people you know, build build that circle, and 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 don't bounce off people. Like you know, but one of the problems is I'll go to someone I know and I'll go, I'll go, hey, you know, let me talk to you about what I do, and they go, I'm really not interested, and you won't go away. Instead of going, I know you're not interested. That's cool, right? Flip them into a referral. Who do you know that I should be talking to? Who else in your circle? And we teach the same thing in military recruiting. You, you go to somebody and they go, look, I'm really not interested in joining the military. You go, that's cool. Who do you know? And the, and the recruiters that do that, like who do you know? Yeah. That, that person, if they're nice to them, if they're mm-hmm. respectful and nice, that person may hook them up with three or four people that are ready to go. And so that's what you got to do. I know you don't want to buy life insurance, but who do you know? I know you don't want to get involved in the insurance industry, but who do you know? Yeah, for a career? yeah. <laughs> exactly. So when, when you're looking at, now I'm looking at leads and, and the way I started the insurance industry, I, uh, I remember my first warm leads, I closed mm-hmm. business, I took that, I reinvested that back into leads, I bought uh, dinner seminar uh, mailers mm-hmm. to be able to come to my dinner seminar. But I always remember being in a position like, wow, you know, if I don't do well at the seminar, if I have a bad seminar or people not mm-hmm. show up, my margin of error was five grand yeah. and I screwed it up. And the funny part is when I did that, they would end up referring me to their friends and family anyway. Mm-hmm. They, they wouldn't say, hey, we'll go to your next free dinner seminar. They'd say, yeah. just go talk to our, yeah. here, here's a number. It, it's, uh, it's, it's always fun to see that circle of influence uh, uh, continue on. So you know, in your book, there's prospecting and then there's fanatical, fanatical right. prospecting. So, so you know, you talk about it not be a job thing. Then the best prospectors don't say, okay, I'm done with my job at five o'clock. I have my prospecting mm-hmm. habit. I leave it. I hang it up and I pick it up the next morning. You talk about it being a lifestyle. Can you unpack that? And it's, it? Yeah, it's always on. Like, I mean, if you think about being fanatic, fanatical says the pipe is life. The pipe is life. <laughs> so if I have a full pipeline, and, and let's go back to your original question about I'm brand new in sales. So how to get good at it? Well, if we, if we were to dial sales down into this, um, it's in every sales conversation, the human being that has the, the, the greatest emotional control mm-hmm. has the highest probability of getting the outcome that they desire. So if I go to you and you say, look, I'm really not in insurance. If I go, oh, my goodness gracious, I just got a rejection, then I'm going to walk away. But if I said, that's cool, I totally get that. I mean, that's not for everybody. Who do you know? Right. If I have that type of emotional control, it's really easy. You're much more likely to say, well, I know Bob over there. Why don't you go talk to Bob? So if we start thinking about prospecting, and I teach people this, like emotional control. So how do you have emotional control? Everything we just talked about on stage was about emotional sure. control, if you think about it. Well, the easiest, fastest way to gain emotional control is have a full pipeline. Think about it. You're, you're closing business, closing business, closing business, and you have, a, you have like a dinner meeting, and you bring people in, and it doesn't make a difference if you lose five grand or not. It doesn't make a difference if, you, if anybody signs up or not. That type of emotional control attracts people to you. It's like a magnet. Yeah. So you want to get better at sales, better at the craft, better at everything, have a full pipeline. But that means that you are always prospecting all the time. And insurance is a tough place to prospect. Anybody who sells insurance knows that if you're standing in front of somebody and you say the word insurance, they're moving in the other direction. We just know that to be true, right? But, but that's just life. So you, you, you learn different ways to approach 
approach people different ways to have things, but prospecting is the key to everything. It is the secret of life. It is activity, 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 activity. But just think about prospecting like if you're building a business. Like the business person that's going to build the best business is the relentless person that every single day they're doing a little bit of activity, right? So it's the cumulative impact of a little bit of prospecting every day. What most people do is they prospect once. Like they have prospecting day. I'm going to have prospecting day. I'm like, no, it's prospecting every day, every single day. And, and in your world, in the, in the PHP world, it is prospecting in Walmart. It is prospecting McDonald's. You know how many times I, I I'm, and I don't in the training world, but if I saw you there and you had a logo shirt on, I'd go, that's pretty cool. What, what do you do? Or what kind of company is that? And I always go, are they treating you all right over there? That's what he says. Are they treating you right over there? And they go, and they go yeah. Or they go, no. I said, well, you give me your boss's name. I'll give him a call. <laughs> you know, and I just have conversations with people everywhere. I'm just talking with people. So prospecting never stops. It's always on. Look at the very best salespeople in your life, the people that you know. They never, ever stop. Now, here's the problem. Now, all the people around you in your life are going to get mad at you because you're prospecting all the time. Yeah. Right. I've got dents in my shin where my wife has kicked me under the table because I go, I can help but notice, you know, that blah, 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 blah. Who's the person around here? I'm like, ow. Yeah. You know, so. My yeah. My kids know it's going to exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, exactly. Everywhere. So, but the same thing for recruiting. Like, you know, if I'm, if, you know, when I'm recruiting people, I'm always on the lookout for talent. I'm always looking for people. And if I meet someone and I like them, like they've got a great personality or there's someone, I go, you know, listen, I, I, I know you're probably happy where you are right now, but I got an opportunity. I'm wondering if we could sit down and have a cup of coffee so I could learn a little bit more about you to see if you'd be a fit for it. Um, how about next Thursday? I'm buying. And I meet more people that way. And I'll sit down and have a conversation. If I like them, I go, you know, may, this might not be the right time for you. I totally get that. Let me grab all your information. And I just put them on my dial list. Yeah. And the thing about it is that everybody's going to have something that changes in their life. And when it changes and they're thinking about me, I'm going to be the first person they call. So you're building, I call it, you're building a drawer full of resumes, right? I'm building a drawer full of people. Yeah. And these days it's not a drawer like it's in your phone. But I mean, in the old days, it was a drawer full of things. And that way I always have somebody, always got somebody coming in, always building, you know, building my pipe. So, it, and I think that's what people miss sometimes is that you're thinking like prospecting is some sort of a, you know, the immediate, like, immediate reaction. it doesn't work that way. And, and by the way, it's not that way. It is not a, it's not like. You prospect, therefore you get. Correct. And it's like in the book, we talk about the 30-day rule. The prospecting you do in any 30-day period has a tendency to pay off over the next 90 days. The talking with people that you do in any given 30-day period pays off over time. That's why you have to do it every day, every day, every day, every day. You're making your own luck. No, even, you say, even the opening pages of your book, you're talking about a guy that was in an insurance company. He says, hey, just go back and call back for April reviews. Mm-hmm. The guy was hesitant about you. Yeah. Yeah. And so... Let's talk about the perspective of how people perceive life insurance. Mm-hmm. You know, because we believe that we're going to change the way and disrupt the industry and the way people see life mm-hmm. insurance. In your experience, in your in, in, in your, your your ability to see companies, what can what can we do as life insurance, a life, life insurance marketing organization, life insurance agents? What can we do to change the perception of? People that being revolted anytime they see somebody saying, "I do insurance." Well, I don't know that you can. I don't know that you're going to change that perception. I mean, the, I think the truth is, is that that's sort of hardwired. Like, it, you know, when I go to a networking event and they go, "What do you do?" I say, "I train salespeople." They're like, they're moving in another direction. I mean, they're, you know, it's just okay. when you say sales, this is it's just what we do. I think what you have to st- start thinking about is is how do you change the perception of the human being that you're having a conversation with, rather than trying to change a, as a whole. And think about this. People buy life insurance for their reasons, not yours. So what most people are doing is they're talking at people about why they should get life insurance versus having a conversation with people about what's happening in their life, what assets do they want to protect, what's important to them. And, and, and it's generational. It depends on who you're talking with. So, you know, for my generation, it can be, it can be a hedge on, you know, on wealth. So sure. life insurance fits that it's, or a hedge on your business, you know, so, um, so do you have enough life insurance? So if something happens to the key person in the business for a young, you know, young family, like when I first, you know, got married and you we were talking about having a family, the very first thing I did was bought life insurance. So that it's, you know, it's, so that it was a, a, it was a protection against sure. something happening in the future. But I had a, I had a motivation for doing that then that was different than when I bought life insurance a few years ago. Yeah. 
because in that situation, I'm trying to protect the people in my company yeah. that if something happens to me, yeah. that there's enough money to, to make sure that the business is sustainable because I got a lot of families that count on me. Yeah. So I think what you have to do is you sit down and have a conversation, not about life insurance, but about, you know, it's about in, investing in financial future and your assets and um, what's important to you both emotionally and you know, and objectively. So, you know, there's emotional outcomes for people and then there's, you know, there's what we call business outcomes, but there's, you know, there's, there's tangible outcomes. Mm -hmm. So that's what gets messed. And so we start thinking about is a system, right? Mm -hmm. The system is not talking at you. I want to talk to you about life insurance. Okay. Those are the, those are the words that are going to get you kicked out of the room. If you said, you know, I'm, I want to sit down with you because I, I help people who are in your situation, you know, protect their, their future yeah. and, you know, and build a better future for their family. And I don't know if what I do is right for you, but I thought maybe we could sit down and have a conversation. See, I like the position. Yeah. The, 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 what you said, the tonality, even your, your demeanor, mm -hmm. your physiology. I mean, you talk about, uh, you know, sales uh, having a science behind it. You know, mm -hmm. What is it right here? You talk about uh, efficiency, effectiveness equals performance. Mm -hmm. so, so I can see the person, you know, getting ready to get ready mm -hmm. and then they never execute. Right. Right. And so... It, it, when you're coaching salespeople or you're coaching the sales process, what are some of the dynamics you're keying on as you observe people role play or as people you're observing them in your, in your business, yeah. in the cubicles or in your virtual Zoom? What are you observing in some of the qualities you're coaching people? Well, I watch for, you know, for, um, um, first thing is, are you doing it or not doing it? Like you're planning to plan to plan to plan. Like are you rearranging your desk so that your pen is facing due north? Because we all know like when your pen's facing due north, rejection's sweeter. Like we know that. So are you planning to plan to plan? So so when I'm coaching people, if you like, if you were to come to a fanatical prospecting boot camp, it looks like this. I walk in the room and I go, you have 15 minutes to make $15 and set one appointment, go. People look at me. Like, and I think military, right? So, because yeah, yeah. I walk into battalions and do this in the military, and like usually there's a command sergeant major sitting next to me, he's so like, yeah. like he's right behind me. So I'm like I look real tough, but he's like push ups if you don't do it. This, <laughs> this guy's. But what I do is I just I put people in a position where I I don't allow them time to think. So I watch them and I'll, they'll look at me and I go 15 minutes, 15 dials, one appointment. Now you'll notice. It's all about what, how I say it. I'm confident. Like nobody goes, like leaders will say, how do you get people to do that? I'm like, I'm Teflon. No, they can say anything. They'll go, oh, I don't really have my list. That's okay. Pick something in your phone. Okay. I, nobody's going to be calling. I mean, nobody's going to be at office right now. That's okay. We're going to do it anyway. So what happens is when they do it and they just call and they're terrible at it. But somebody gets an appointment. Three or four people get an appointment. They go, well, that wasn't that hard. I'm going to go, yeah, well, it wasn't hard. Well, we weren't thinking about it. You just made us do it. I go, great, right? So most of it was in your head. And then we picked up the phone and we called some strangers and it worked. So then I'll just teach people how to do this. So then I'll look for, are you hesitating, insecurity? Um, you saw us on stage where, you know, it was just changing a little bit of the way that people, you know, approach mm -hmm. each other. So just something like, you know, um, how so? Like a little question like that. How so? How come? Like, how do you mean? Yeah. Little questions like that to get people to engage. So I'm coaching language. I'm coaching approach. Yeah. You just said, I like the way you approached it. I, I'm, I'm approaching, are you relaxed? Are you assertive? Are you confident? Or do you look and come off as insecure? Are you, are you talking about yourself? Are you having a conversation with them? I'm sorry, hit the mic there. Uh, are you talking about yourself or are you talking about them? So it's, I'm, I'm just, I'm coaching the nuance. Yeah. So I teach frameworks. Here's how you make a prospecting call. Here's how you approach someone. Here's how you deal with an objection. I teach the framework, the set of rails, and then I coach the nuance. But first I get out of the head right? Yeah. And get into action. Because yeah. because it didn't make a difference if we're thinking about it. If we're not doing, it doesn't make a difference. So we got to do first. It's funny because, you know, uh, of course, you've seen the movie of you know, Wolf of Wall Street. I don't know what salesperson has, right? And the reason why he says I do the exercise is I want to know whether or not you're trying to pitch me or you're asking mm -hmm. me. Yes. That was the purpose of it. Are yep. you trying to sell me the pen or are you asking me if I want to buy a pen? Yep. That's the purpose of that simple exactly. exercise. And so when, when you're looking at, you know, uh, more of the new people. Here, here's the biggest question I get asked all the time. Hey, Matt, how do you, you know, what do you say when so-and-so? What do you say when so-and-so? What do you say when so-and-so? They always ask me what I say. But I never get the question of, what do I ask? Yes. So it, it, would that be a big paradigm shift? 80% of, of selling is discovery. <laughs> which is asking, right? 80% of sales. Like, this, you know, if you start thinking about what's what's the sexy parts of sales are closing, 
Getting past objections and prospecting. That's what everybody wants to talk about. Sure. What nobody wants to talk about is what's most important, which is the middle part. Yeah. So in every sales conversation, the person that you're having that conversation with is asking five questions of you. Now, those questions are being asked at both the conscious and subconscious level. Sure. Do I like you? Yeah. Do you listen to me? Do you make me feel important? Do you get me in my problems? Do you understand me? And do I trust and believe you? Well, the easiest way to be likable is to shut up and listen. Like you don't have to worry about anything else. If you're listening to people, they love you. The easiest way, the way to make someone feel important is to listen to them. The easiest way to demonstrate that you get people is to talk about their reasons for buying life insurance, not your reasons, yeah. right? So, yeah. so if you were telling me your story, right, you communicate in stories. I go, tell me about your family. Tell me what's important to you. And you go, blah, 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 blah. And I, and I, and I go, so what I think I hear you're saying is that the most important thing for you in the entire world is that if something were to happen to you, that your wife and your young son would be taken care of and okay. Like you worry about that more than anything because of your job. Did I get that right? Yes. And you would say, yeah. And I would say, I totally get that. You know, when I was a young dad, you know, I, 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 the thing that, that was, I was most concerned about is that I would go on a trip and I wouldn't come back. And then, you know, what would happen to him? And, you know, I could see in my, in my, you know, in my head what the future would look like without me. And, um, and I, that's one of the reasons why I stepped into a life insurance policy because it gave me some peace of mind that I, I was stepping up to the plate as a man and doing the right thing for my family. And um, so tell me a little bit more about, uh, about what you and your wife talk about when it comes to your financial future. So all I did was just take your story, right? I repeat it back to you in a way that says, hey, I get you. These are my words. Right. And, and, and at the more that, that I'm able to, to demonstrate that I get you, the more likely you are to trust me, right? So because all, all, all we're really doing is you're saying, hey, I trust and believe what you're saying to me. And this makes sense, right? So if it just makes sense, why wouldn't we go ahead and do it? And, and what most people are doing is, salespeople are doing, especially new people, you think that it's about the gift of gap. Like you think that it's about talking. It is not about talking. Nobody cares about what you have to say. They only care about what's important to them. And I want you to think about this for just a second when you start thinking about discovery and asking questions. Because you're exactly, nobody ever asked me, what do you ask? They always ask me what I say. And I'm like, you're asking the wrong question. Because it's not what I say. It's what I ask. Because anything that I say is a derivative of something that I've asked. So another way of looking at that is the question that you ask is more important than anything that you could say. And anything that you say is more powerful and impactful when delivered in the form of a question. So just think about that. So I want you to think about in your life, right? Um, is there someone that you would describe this way? This person totally gets me. Sure. Okay, who would that be? My wife. Okay, your wife. So your wife totally gets you. Now you think about the relationship of your wife, right? And I met your wife, and she's lovely, <laughs> right? She's wonderful. Um, and so, so like you and your wife probably have this like secret language, right? So sure. yeah, and so you can look at each other and have a conversation. My wife and I have the same thing. You um like you nobody knows what you're thinking, but you you know what you're thinking. Like my I've been married for almost thirty years now. I can look at my wife and I know exactly what she's thinking <laughs> from across the room. Uh, you you probably tell jokes that no one else gets but you. Of course. Yep. You laugh all the time, and and it's like it's this relationship where you just it just it's comfortable, like it feels right. Yeah. That's the most important relationship in your life. Mm -hmm. Get. A person who gets me, it's, it's, it's more valuable than anything else that you have. Now, if you just think about sales for a second, do I like you? Do you listen to me? Do you make me feel, feel important? Do you get me in my problems? Do I trust and believe you? Demonstrating get, I get you, is the key to everything. Like it is the secret. It's called a bridge, right? So what all I'm doing is I'm connecting the dots between what's important to you okay. and how I can solve that problem for you through insurance mm -hmm. using your language, not mine. Like I'm, I'm coming back to you. I'm not talking about insurance. I'm talking about what's important to you. Right. And, and I, what I'm doing in the process is I'm, I'm creating that same emotional bond. Now it's not, it's not like being married to anybody. You're never really going to have that type of a bond with someone you're selling anything to. Sure. But the same emotions, the same psychology is there. And when people do that, and if you just think about stuff that you've bought, when you, when like the person demonstrated that they really got you, yeah. that was the moment where like it just happened. Like everything flowed downhill from there. So what I'm doing in discovery, the questions I'm asking, right? I'm, I'm prospect to have the opportunity to do that. Prospecting is asking about time right? Are asking for time. Sales is asking for commitments. And we, the, the, the two things are different, but I can't ask for commitments until I have time. If I'm on a prospecting call and I'm doing discovery, I'm in the wrong place. Get the meeting, sit down with someone, have an opportunity for them to have a conversation with you. But then when I meet them, don't pitch. 
Right? If you're pitching, you're losing. So what I do is just sit down and say, tell me about your family. Tell me what's important to you. They know why you're there. I mean, there's not like they don't, it's not a secret. Right, right. So I have been asked that question, like, why I'm selling insurance. Like most people run from insurance, people who, some people sell insurance. Why would you sit down with me? Shut up. My goal in a conversation is to ask. Right, you overcome an objection before it even comes. Exactly. To, well, it's a 600 pound gorilla. Yeah. You know, why would you meet with me? Yeah, yeah. Well, I've been thinking about this. You know, I've been doing this or, you know, my, my mom and dad, you know, died recently, or this happened, this happened, this happened. And then, and then all I'm doing is allowing you to talk. My goal in any conversation is to ask as few questions as possible to create as much information as possible. And what I'm doing is, as I ask questions and get people to begin telling their stories, I reward the story by listening to them, like by leaning into it, by paying attention to it, by repeating what they're saying to me. And by doing that, I trigger something called the self-disclosure loop. And the self-disclosure loop is um, just the way the brain works. It's a neurophysical response to a person basically revealing pieces about themselves. You've noticed this at a party. You've sat down to have, at a party. You've had a conversation with someone, and you're just kind of in a listening mood, and they're just mm-hmm. talking, 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 talking. And like pretty soon, like they keep talking, and, and there's this moment when they cross the TMI zone, and you're like, OMG, I can't believe you just said that. And you know that's happened to you, right? You're like, I can't believe. But they, and they knew that they shouldn't say it. You've done it too, right? You, they knew it. But they said it anyway. And then they kept going. Yeah. And the reason that happened is because as they were self-revealing, they were getting a dopamine hit to the brain, which is essentially brain crack, right? They were just getting. And, and so it's kind of like if you drink, if you drink too much, like the alcohol does the same thing. It, 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 it you, 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 you say something and it just feels, it feels good. Like you, you get de-inhibited, I guess, or inhibited, I guess is how you say that. Same thing happens. You get a little brain, brain crack, a little dopamine hit. You keep talking, keep talking, keep talking. Well, if you just let people do that, like if you stay out of the get way, you right, you stop you pitching, <laughs> don't ask closing the questions, you know, reward them for talking with you. They'll tell you their entire story. They'll give you everything. And then all you have to do, this is how you, you, you demonstrate, you get to, all you have to do is just build a bridge. You say, I totally get it. You know, your, your, you know, your, your, your term insurance policy that you've had for 20 years is running out. You don't know exactly what to do. And you, you and your wife are a little bit nervous because you've got, you know, another, you know, 25 years left Mm -hmm. and you're not quite sure what's going to happen. And, uh, and if I were in your shoes, I'd probably feel the same way. And that's really what I want to do today is just explore how we might be able to fill that gap and give you guys the peace of mind that you're looking for and stay within your budget. So, Jeff, the way I'm looking at this, you don't really have any fancy sales closes. It's all about how you open and how you prospect. It's just a natural conclusion to a conversation. Yeah. Well, yeah, because th- think about this. Like The close is simply this, ask. right? So you, you can't wait for people to do the job for you. Yeah. So, but the close is this. If if you gave me time. So you just think about this. If I prospected and you, and you agreed to meet with me, okay, you agreed to meet with me for a reason. Sure. If, there, you, if you don't want to buy insurance or you don't want to sell insurance, if you, like, if you absolutely don't want to do that, you will not meet with me. It doesn't make a difference. I, I'm good and I can get people to meet with me that you probably can and other people can't. I'm just good at doing that. But if you don't want to buy what I'm selling, you are not going to meet with me. <laughs> Because when I sh- and so you got to figure out the fact that they're meeting there, they came, they came there for a reason. I need to find the reason. All I do is ask questions. All I do is say to me, based on everything you've told me, this is what makes the most sense. And I just shut up. And they go, Yeah. yeah. I go, Okay. Well, here's what we need to do. Sign there. I, I might like going. Yeah. Let me look. Let me, let's put three things in a row and see all this. I don't don't do Ben Franklin closes. I don't do any kind of fancy close. I do my job as a salesperson. My job as a salesperson is to uncover what the problems are, to build a bridge to the problem. And if I do a good enough job with that and it makes sense, why in the world wouldn't we do business? That doesn't mean I won't get an objection. It doesn't mean a person might say, listen, I need to go talk to my, my family about this. I need to look at my finances. I need to see if this is the right thing for me. I need to see if I can make this commitment. I'm going to get those things. But the thing about an objection when you're asking for that big commitment, a big commitment of money or time, right, or commitment, when you're, when you're asking for that is if you didn't do discovery, you have no ammunition. Like you have nothing. So if you said, you know, I, I just, I just, I'm really worried about whether or not I can afford this. Yep. And I go, well, you know, I totally get where you're coming from because if I were in your shoes, mm-hmm. that's exactly what I'd be worried about too. I just relate to you as a human being. And I go... Um, I'm just, I'm just curious, like other than, you know, the, the budget issue, sure. um, what else about this worries you? 
Like, and you'll notice how I say that. You know, what else? I don't say what else is holding you back. I just what's worrying about this? Because we're worrying about this. And they'll say, nothing, really. I mean, I just don't know if I can fit this in. I go, well, let's get the calculator out and let's figure this out. I mean, you told me that this is what you're trying to do and this is what was out there and this was at, was at risk for you. Sure. Let's just figure this out. And, and once you do that, like, it's it's easy. Natural course. Yeah. That's a couple of, that's a couple of thoughts. That's a couple of questions. Um, in this world of social media, in this world, because yeah, we have the benefit of being mm-hmm. here. I can see you, physiology, mm-hmm. right? What's some of the mistakes people make with fanatical prospecting, just using social media prospecting as a method? And to add on to that, you know, you talk about, you know, social prospecting as well as outbound prospecting. Yep. It's a powerful combination. Yes. So if we think about um, social media, right? So social media as a rule. So if I'm, if I'm on social media, what I'm really doing is I'm building my story and I'm attracting people. So you think about your presence on social media as marketing. Sure. So all marketing is is creating your personal brand. Right. And that's, that's primarily what it should be. Mm-hmm. So you're attracting people to you. You're bringing people in. Um, I want to move people off of social media into other mechanisms. Sure. So I want to move them onto my email list, which is a big deal for me. I want to move them. I have a, I have a text message, a private text messaging group, my insiders, right? So it's not a huge amount of people, but they're able to, to connect right with away. me right away. They can talk to me any way they want to. And literally, I mean, I'll get on the airplane and I'm, I'm texting people and it's, I want those people there. Those are people that buy stuff from me because they, they trust me. So I want to, I want to do that. Where, where we make mistakes on social media is with direct messaging. So direct messaging is like, for me, like the Swiss, it's the Swiss army knife of sales, okay. right? Because if you think about most direct messaging apps, you can leave a voicemail. You can, you can leave sure. a voicemail on mes- you messenger. Message? Or you can leave a voicemail on, you know, on LinkedIn. Sure. You can post a video message natively on LinkedIn. On messenger, you can just upload a video message directly in the messenger. On, on Instagram, the other day ago, this, this cat came on and he was like saying really nice things about my book. So I went to DM him and I realized that there's a little video thing at the top of the, the DM thing at, on, on Instagram. I clicked it and like I'm in a video conversation with this guy. He's in India, like boom. And we're talking and it was right, great. Right. It was amazing. So I've seen a lot of people who are getting a, a lot of really good conversations for that. But you can put a video message on there. You can whatever. Same thing on Twitter if you've got a connection with people. So that's a good thing. The problem is... Is the, is the same issue, right? Is if I'm talking at people, right, they're not going to want to work with me. So you think if I'm sending an email, if I'm sending a DM, yep. same thing. But with DM, people are more sensitive. You can send an email to someone and be a lot more direct than on a DM. So one, I'll just give you one of the biggest mistakes is the connection request bait and switch. And this happens primarily on LinkedIn. Okay. So I see you on LinkedIn yep. and, I, and I, I do a connection request and then you accept it. And then my very next message to you is a pitch. Sure. Right. Then that's like the relationship is over. Yeah. So with social media, it's much more nuanced. I want to. I want to. Um, I want to tap into reciprocity. Like if I do something nice for you, it creates a, a reason for you to do something nice for me. I can do that by liking your stuff. By you know by. Um, you know, by sharing it, by talking about it. I want to do those things. And when I approach you on social media, I want to approach you more like this. That was a really cool picture that you posted of your family. That was awesome. I'm just, you know, I wish, I wish that, you know, that, that I had a family as beautiful as yours, you know, something <laughs> like that, you know, but the, that's how you're going to connect with people. Engagement. Yeah, it's engagement, sure. but it's a much slower process. It is definitely not quid pro quo. It is not, you know, hit, hit the direct message and then you're going to get somebody back, especially if you're selling insurance and not going to work or that way. To yeah, it's not going to work that. Recruiting is a little bit different, especially if you, if you're, if you're doing it openly and transparently mm-hmm. and people come to you like from a, for a recruiter standpoint, what you really want to be is like, you want to be honey. Like you want to attract people in. Okay. So they want to see you having a good time. They want to see you and not, not, not doing, you know, you don't want to like be cheesy, but they want, you want to, you want to show that you're successful at this. You want to show the people on your team, take pictures. People have a good time. Mm-hmm. And and look, I, I posted something on LinkedIn just recently. I was looking for a trainer, and you know, I, people come to me, and I got like the, I've got the greatest person in the world, Gene Tremarco, amazing, and came from LinkedIn, and it wouldn't have happened, but we knew each other on social. There was a yeah. you know there was a process there. So I think you just have to you're playing the long game on social, but direct message is powerful. But you just need to make sure that the message is about them. So if I was going to like recruit somebody, I might say, you know, I noticed that. Um, you know, you've been doing a whole bunch of different things on social and you're, you know, you're, you've got four or five different side gigs and it sounds to me like you got some pretty big goals. 
I got an opportunity that you might be interested in taking a look at because of the lifestyle that you're living. Why don't we get together? That would be really easy. But I'm going to talk about something that I've seen you do specific to you. Yeah. And, and again, do you make me feel important? Do you, know, do you get me? Do you understand me? Are you you're paying attention to me? Do those things and you'll be a lot better off. But the big thing for me with social is get, get it off of social, get it onto the phone or get it in person. Gotcha. Jeff, you've been so gracious with your time. I appreciate your time and attention. Your commitment to come to our event in spite of this weather here. <laughs> 12 degree temperature in Louisville, Kentucky. And then you fought through the elements to get here. And uh, appreciate you even dealing with the whole COVID-19 protocol. We have to say so. This is kind of weird. We have reverse ring. But so that being said, guys, make sure you have it done so already. Make sure you pick up Fanatical Prospect and Sales and Cure, many other books. And follow Jeff Dunn here at, at Sales Gravy. And connect with them, as you just mentioned here on LinkedIn. With that being said, guys, if you're watching this on Facebook, make sure you click like, follow our Facebook business page, Money Smart Guy. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you click subscribe, the notifications to be alerted next time we upload our next episode. With that being said, guys, I want to know your thoughts, your feedback, your comments. Drop them in the comment section below. I'm behalf of Jeff Dunn, I'm your Money Smart Guy. And until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today.